Welcome to Mid-Level Adventurers, a podcast where non-experts talk about the things they love. I'm Jared Jehoda, and with me for this first series is my co-host, Matt Morris. Hello everyone, it's Matt Morris. Dungeons & Dragons is a fantasy role-playing game complete with magic, swords, monsters, devils, angels, and gods. The gods of the D&D multiverse are as varied as the worlds themselves. Some planes have very active gods that constantly interfere and make their presence felt. Others have gods that communicate only with their chosen few. And some gods have been sealed away and can only grant spells to the truly devout. And other worlds have no gods at all. Sometimes the gods are strange and weird, like Bane or Lathander. But sometimes the gods are more familiar to us, like Ares, Apollo, or Ra. Each world is different, and the gods are plentiful. Oh, come all ye faithful, it's time to talk about the divine. Right away, Matt, we need to just get it out in the open. We are not going to be listing off every pantheon, every deity, and what they do. We will make some notable mentions, but there are just way too many gods and pantheons to talk about them in a list format. Very correct. I wouldn't even dare to, to begin that journey. Yeah, exactly. But I'm going to ask you this question. What D&D gods are you familiar with right off the top of the bat? Just a general few that you know about, and maybe one or two that you've interacted with or had in a campaign. You know, that kind of thing. Well, I am, I mean, unsurprisingly, not familiar with a lot. But uh, I can say that the most familiar with the one who is the god of my cleric, my current character that I'm playing in Newly, Farlon. I think. Yeah, because English is weird and the spelling is weird. It's either Farlane or Farlane. Yeah, could be Farlane. I like Farlane because he's the god of, you know, horizons and roads. That's true. Yeah, that's a good point. That is his sort of MO. He's the god of travel and roads, distance, that sort of thing. So yeah, I'm most familiar with him. It's kind of funny. I believe my character is, he's a new cleric, right? He's a young cleric. So he's still learning a bit about the god as we go. So he and I are kind of making that journey of discovery together. But so far, he's been a pretty interesting one. He's not a very heavy-handed god, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And just like in general, a little more relaxed in the religious requirements and expectations of the clerics of this god. So yeah, not very not very familiar with, with many at all, unfortunately. There is still that mysterious character that appeared in Newly that uh, I still don't know who he was. He was created as a one in a hundred shot that you would actually meet him, and it just sort of happened. Um, but other than that, I mean, I think I'm sure we'll we'll probably mention a few of these uh, as we go. But there are there are a few that I don't necessarily know from in game, but the names are just familiar to me because they are pulled from you know some of the gods that we know in, in ancient cultures, right? And some of which you've mentioned already. People like Ares, and I'm pretty sure Odin is is in there. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've got a, a, a much better list than I do. Well, I know a lot of the Greyhawk deities from 3.5 because I read those books cover to cover mm -hmm. many times. So I know a bit about them, at least in terms of their portfolios or their domains, if you will. But I think the ones I know the most about in terms of their backstory and history are Loth, Corlon, Asmodeus, and a couple of deities that I've made for various campaign settings. Mm-hmm. But I'm always learning more about them because people will play characters that want to play off of a certain deity that I may not have much experience with. So I'll kind of do some research and learn that way. Yeah. You know, I use Paylor a lot because he's kind of a good sun god, I feel. Oh, yeah. But there's so much lore to each of these gods that exist. It's almost impossible to know everything about them. Yeah, that's true. Kind of the fun thing about all these gods is that sometimes these gods have different histories depending on the setting that they're in. And sometimes they don't even exist in the settings. Mm. Dark Sun famously has no gods whatsoever. And the Eberron pantheon is very different from the Forgotten Realms, which is different from the Greyhawk pantheon. Some of these, and I don't know if they are, like you mentioned, I don't know if they're always present, but some of these gods, their names have come up in either reading or, or hearing other players talk about them just because they're attached to pretty significant things, I guess, you know, for lack of a better term, like Mistra, mm -hmm. the goddess of magic, all right? That's a big one. Right. Bane being the, the god of hatred and tyranny. So things like that, I, you know, those names have come up because they're, they're more prominent, whereas perhaps no one has heard of uh, Farlane <laughs> because he's... yeah. Not attached to something so prominent like magic. But there are so many out there that are, you know, 
if, if, if there's something that there can be a god of, I'm sure it's it exists. Yeah, I mean, in Greyhawk alone, traditionally, the list of that pantheon is over 100 deities. Oh, wow. Now, it's true that sometimes gods will cross over, or they'll be the same god, but with a different name in some pantheons. There are some people who like equate like Elona and Maliki a lot, hmm. because they both are like unicorn-based nature deities. Yeah. So they consider them an analog of one another. Makes sense. I've also noticed, too, that there are, for any one attribute, there might be several gods that are attached to that, which might be a little confusing. Even with my cleric in Muli, he is the cleric of the knowledge domain. You know, there are a couple of choices for what god I might have as a knowledge cleric. Yeah. Well, that's good to bring up. You know, what are these domains? What do they mean? How do they relate to gameplay? I have a little definition here that I looked up that will hopefully explain this better than I will just rambling. But uh, the domains are specific areas of interest for deities, particularly to do with the magic and spells that are granted to their faithful. Right, yeah, mechanically, at certain levels, clerics get free spells that are always prepared based on the domain that they've chosen. Mm -hmm. So, yes, that is absolutely true. And taking, for example, Farling, he has several domains, actually. You know, doing a list of all the gods' domains would be much longer than a list of the gods themselves. So, But if you kind of know what direction you might want to head in with a character, for instance, finding a domain can probably lead you back to a god. Yeah, and it should be noted that a domain is different than a portfolio or an area of influence. Mm -hmm. The domains that exist officially in 5e are Forge, Grave, Knowledge, Life, Light, Nature, Order, Peace, Tempest, Trickery, Twilight and War. Mm -hmm. Now, you might think like, oh, but what if there's more than one god of war? There totally is. And it's all about the viewpoint on the gods. For example, Pelor is both life and light. Korlon is also life and light, but they are also arcana and war. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it just depends on the god and the history. So it is very possible for gods to overlap with domains, but have different portfolios. Pelor is sort of this god of sunlight and dawn and harvest and that sort of thing, like gro the growing of things and the new day. Corlon, meanwhile, is the king head of the elvish pantheon. As such, they have many domains that fall under their viewpoint because it's a cultural thing. It's not just there can be only one. Makes sense. So domains are what can make a cleric unique in terms of the spells that are given. A forge domain cleric will get different spells granted to them than a twilight domain cleric. Some of those spells may overlap. There may be cases where domains share spells. But the fun things about the domain spells that are granted is that they are always prepared for the cleric, and they do not count against the number of spells that you can prepare per day. So they're kind of like freebies. Yes, that's very cool. And I guess it may also be important to note, and forgive me if I'm getting ahead of ourselves, who can use domains? Like, who can actually tap into that? Is it only clerics? Yes, domains are a cleric feature that they are granted at level 1. Unlike many other classes, you get to choose your domain at first level. So the minute you become a cleric, you select a domain affiliated with your god. And you may be able to sway a DM to grant you a domain that is not on your god's printed list, if you can make a good enough argument for it, because that god list may have been printed before all the domains were made. For example, the grave domain, which is very, very popular, can kind of be ascribed to most gods, if you think about it, because the grave domain is all about the sanctity of dying and protecting those who have died and honoring that sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So that'll fit in with a god of war, that'll fit in with a god of life even, gods of nature, because yeah. death is a normal thing. Grave clerics are very anti-undeath and corruption. Yes, yeah, that's a good point. And most clerics probably are as well, but I think the grave clerics most so. There is also the death domain, which was not in the list I mentioned. Correct. Because the death domain appears in the Dungeon Master's Guide as an option. Gotcha. And usually that is what evil clerics follow. But I will allow a player to play a death cleric that is neutral. Probably not good. Kind of depends on the god. I actually have a neutral death cleric in my home game. The god I created for them to worship is one that takes the view of death is the natural end of all things. It's a very kind of neutral, maybe neutral evil. He has tenants that say, do not defy death when it is the right time, that sort of thing. Yeah. So if someone is going to die of natural causes, you're not supposed to interfere with that. But if your friend gets cut down in the middle of a battle, you can kind of fudge that a little bit. 
Makes sense. The domains are very different and grant you different bonuses and different boons. Mm -hmm. So you should check them out if you want to play a cleric and find one that works for you. Yeah, or multi-class into a cleric. Yeah, you can do that as well. One fun little thing we like to do here on Mid-Level Adventures is go to our tavern corner and talk about what we are imbibing tonight. So Matt, what are you imbibing this evening? Well, I am, for the third time now, imbibing some bourbon. It's uh -huh. what I've had in the house, and I like it, of course. So tonight I'm drinking some Buffalo Trace. Oh, yeah. I think uh, this one's probably a little more well-known. It's a fantastic, dare I say, entry-level bourbon for people that are looking to get into something to maybe drink straight. And I think I made a comment last week about, like, the sort of sweet spot range for, for finding bourbons, you know, in and around $30. And I think Buffalo Trace, it's even cheaper than that in most places that don't include New York City. So Buffalo Trace is, is usually easy to get and affordable if you want to try it. And apparently the guy who created it made it to be not only good for drinking straight, but also in cocktails. And mm -hmm. I found a little story. This is my fun fact about Buffalo Trace, and then I'll, I'll be done. Some people wanted to put that to a test. So they got together some professional bartenders and some just regular people, and they did some blind taste tests with different bourbons in an old-fashioned. And the most voted favorite was Buffalo Trace. Very cool. Yeah, I know multiple bourbon drinkers that always have a bottle of Buffalo Trace around. I really think if you're serious or just starting to get into having bourbon around, I would say, yeah, I'd recommend at least having that always. It's versatile. It's very good. What more can you say? So what are you what are you drinking tonight, Jared? Tonight I am drinking a brew that I found at a new store, to me anyway, that I went to. Uh, masked up, only five people allowed at a time. They're very strictly following the guidelines. Mm -hmm. But it is from Single Cut Brewsmiths. Oh, okay. Yeah, which is here in Astoria, New York. Oh, cool. And also in Clifton Park. So it, maybe their distribution is here, but it's brewed up there. I'm not entirely sure. But I've seen them around here and there. But I wanted to try a couple of their brews. So this is the Single Cut Freeform Jazz Odyssey. Hmm. What intrigued me about it is that it's a lager, which I like lagers, with coconut and cocoa. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's interesting. It's interesting. It's very aggressive on the front end, almost too bitter, but then the back end is very soothing, and the back end is where you get the coconut, which is weird. It is a weird beer. I like those, though. I, I like a good weird yeah, beer. Yeah, I don't hate it. Would you drink it all the time? Maybe not, but every now and then it's nice to mix it up, isn't it? In a weird way, and this is one of the negatives in my mind, it has almost a coffee flavor kind of around the middle. Sure. I think it's the combination of cocoa and coconut that makes it taste coffee-like, which is weird to me. Yeah. Maybe I'm totally off base. No, I could see that. Yeah. It's pretty cool, and it's got this really cool psychedelic spaceman on the label here. I love good beer art. Like, kudos to the artists that specifically do beer art, and the breweries that hire them. Yes, absolutely. Good for them. Yes, was pricey, but yeah, that's the way of craft beer. It's true. I like to strike a good balance. Yeah. Splurge a little. I think I paid somewhere in the range of 13 to 16 for a four-pack, which is a lot of money. Probably a pint-sized can. Yeah. But, you know, it's cheaper than drinking in a bar, so there's that, I guess. <laughs> yeah. This beer at a bar, probably seven or eight bucks. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't mind paying a price for a premium beer. This is a well-made, well-crafted beer. Mm -hmm. And a well-crafted beer doesn't mean that everyone will like it. You know, sometimes they made it exactly like they wanted to, and it's just not, doesn't suit everyone. Yeah, but I can appreciate the time and effort that went into this. Yeah. And it's not bad. Like, I do like it, but I would not drink it every day. But yeah, that's what I'm drinking tonight. And that's what you're drinking tonight. Cheers. Cheers. And that's what we're imbibing tonight. But what are these pantheons that we keep talking about? We keep talking about the Forgotten Realms. We keep talking about Greyhawk. Mm -hmm. But what do these mean? The Forgotten Realms is a campaign setting. Greyhawk is a campaign setting. Exandria is a campaign setting. The list goes on and on and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. So each of these worlds may have one or multiple pantheons. Sometimes there is kind of a generic, quote-unquote, human pantheon, which multiple races or species or cultures may prescribe to. But there may also be cultural deities as well. Mm -hmm. For example, in the Forgotten Realms, there are these general deities that exist. Deities such as Bane and Helm and Ilmater. They are not cultural deities. They are generic. Anyone and everyone can worship these deities. Yet there is also an Elvish pantheon, a Gnomish pantheon, a Dwarven pantheon, an Orcish pantheon, a Drow pantheon. 
So there's different pantheons. And even in the Forgotten Realms, there is an Olympian pantheon as well. If I am not mistaken, humans on the Forgotten Realm, on Toril, actually arrived via a portal from Earth millennia ago. Sure. And they brought some of their gods with them. So there are parts of Toril where Poseidon is venerated, or Aphrodite is venerated, or Ra is venerated. Very cool. Greyhawk, for example, has one pantheon, but it is massive. So, Mm -hmm. so massive, especially if you look at older editions. I said earlier that there are over 100 gods in Greyhawk alone, and those gods are broken up into pretty much four categories. There's greater deities at the top, then there's the intermediate deities, and that's kind of mid-level gods, and then there are lesser deities, and then below them there are demigods. So I would equate Greyhawk to being a very polytheistic culture with a lot of little areas that gods specialize in. Uh, There are, of course, also elves on Greyhawk. So there is an elvish pantheon. There is a dwarven pantheon. So you also have cultural gods and cultural pantheons. You can mix and match and use and ignore as many of these deities as you want to incorporate into your world, into your campaign. Even if you play in the Forgotten Realms, you don't need to use all of the many, 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 many gods that are in that campaign. Not every town or every city has to have a temple of Coralon, a temple of Lathander, a temple of Poseidon. You don't need to have that everywhere. Right. You can treat it as there are regions where these gods are more popular than others. For example, Wizards just put out Rime of the Frost Maiden fairly mm-hmm. recently that focuses heavily on the goddess Oral. And she is very much not worshipped in most parts of the world, but up in Icewind Dale, up in Ten Towns, she's pretty prominent. And that's <laughs> kind of the point of the adventure, right? Yep. It's cool, yeah, to have something focus on a, like you said, less prominent deity. Suddenly it's in the forefront. Yeah, because if you're just like doing something for the Temple of Lathander, well, anybody could do that because Lathander is found everywhere. Yeah. But what I do think is fun is to think about how these gods interact with the world and specifically in the area in which your campaign is taking place. You know, are they active? Are they passive? Are they embraced? Are there gods that are prohibited or vilified for a reason, whatever it may be? Yeah, it's... Uh... It's interesting to think of how they influence the world in general and would affect not only other players in your party, non-cleric players, but also NPCs, right? It's not just, it's not only clerics who believe in gods. Of course not. Yeah. Yeah. Commoners believe in gods. Right, right, right. Uh, You know, there's room to sort of show how that influence affects everything, day-to-day life or the unexplained, you know, if you have a god that's particularly heavy-handed. Maybe I shouldn't say unexplained. I guess it would be linked back to a god, perhaps. But, you know, the supernatural, I guess. And it would also be interesting to play a character who is more or less an atheist in one of these settings. I was just thinking that. How fun or interesting would that be? Yeah. In a world where you have proof that these deities exist, they have walked the earth, or they grant spells, how do you deny their existence at that point? Exactly. And then it comes into question, is faith just about proof, or is it about something more? Mm -hmm. And if you don't believe that any of these entities that are granting these spells are actual gods, just very powerful entities, what does that mean? Yeah, it'd be interesting RP opportunities too, especially if you had a religious character in the party, cleric. I guess it's kind of it. I'm trying to think of what other character class might also be religious, but I guess it's kind of a cleric. Well, paladins. Paladins too, yeah, and that, that's a good thing we should probably discern here, because they don't they don't necessarily draw their power from a deity, but they are religious. Correct. Paladins draw their power from an ideal. Right. But they may also prescribe to the teachings of a god. Correct. Etc. Yeah. It used to be that paladins had to be lawful good and they had to follow a lawful good god. And that was the only way to play a paladin. That has since gone by the wayside. That is no longer the case, at least not in 5e. If you want to play that way in your campaign, you're totally allowed to do that. But you are not required to anymore. Right. Yeah, it's all about that oath, isn't it? That's the thing I have to remind myself too, because I've never actually played a paladin. Yeah, it's all about the oath and not about the deity. Right. But we are talking about deities this week, not paladin oaths. Not paladins. That'll be another episode. (laughs) Right. But yeah, I agree. You should think about how these gods or the influence of these gods is going to affect the world in general. Mm -hmm. It's probably highly likely that a farming community is going to venerate a god of harvest and sunlight. Very true, yeah. Probably won't be too into the god of war, but maybe. Yeah. Maybe they keep a shrine to the god of war in an effort to placate him to keep him away. It's fair, yeah. Bribery works for deities sometimes. I was, yeah, I was about to say, there's there's quite a 
few that can be swayed in that way, are there? They're not all pure. <laughs> oh, decidedly not, no. <laughs> there are many, many evil gods. And that brings us to our next tentpole in this, evil gods versus good gods. Because evil gods are just as divine as good gods. And some evil gods may perform good acts, but for a long-term goal with an evil purpose. It all depends on the gods, like so many other things. Yeah, you also have kind of varying degrees of good or evil, right? You, you know, some that are more lawful, some that are more chaotic, some that are perhaps neutral. Probably less so, I guess. That I, I don't know how often we see a neutral god. I do have one example later that we can talk about. Oh, well, there are many neutral gods. Well, a lot of nature gods tend to be neutral. Hmm. Yeah, that's fair. Okay. Take Grumsh, for example, the evil orc god of slaughter and war. Probably not going to save a village from invading demons. Hmm, no. He's up for slaughter. He might enjoy watching. But Asmodeus, Asmodeus will absolutely be willing to help if he is asked. Through his proxies, he may set up a deal and save the village. And maybe all it costs is that when they die, whenever that is, whether it's in the battle or a hundred years from now, everyone in that village keeps fighting demons for him. Ah, yeah. They get to have their mortal life, and so be it. They do whatever they want. But when they die, their soul comes to Asmodeus, and Asmodeus gets to put them on the front lines in the demon war for all eternity. Which is really all Asmodeus wants. He wants to keep the demons at bay, because the Abyss is chaotic evil and the source of all of his problems. If he can win the blood war, then he can focus on other planes of existence and other things to conquer. But not until the Abyss is out of the way. Because evil and good are ideas, you know, they're mm -hmm. concepts. Right. And these ideas are what empower these entities, and those ideas create beliefs, and those beliefs are how they amass followers. And there are some worlds where the amount of power and life force that a deity has is a direct result of how many followers they have. Mm -hmm. Those prayers and those dedications to the deities are what provide strength and power to the deity, so they get stronger by amassing followers. And the deities play to their strengths. They each have their own agenda. The Great Modron March, for example, you know, every 289 years, a march of thousands of Modrons march through the plains for some unknown reason. Nobody hmm. really knows. Is it a reconnaissance mission? Maybe it's a show of force? It's hard to know what's going on in the minds of Primus on the plains of Mechanus. And maybe the gods don't even care about the material planes in the day-to-day, -day, and they only take interest in a specific event. But does that mean those gods are evil? True. They're, they're seeing a bigger picture uh, oftentimes, aren't they? You know, time means something different. And the gods may actively be warring with one another, or maybe they're not. Maybe there's in a divine standoff or a checkmate of some kind. You know, it's hard to know, and it can be whatever you need it to be in your campaign. But what makes these gods interesting, and why are they interesting, and who are the most interesting ones to you or I? This is a question which can expand for days and days. Mm -hmm. But let's keep it focused to just like our top few here. What do you think are some of the most or least interesting gods that you have read about or want to know more about? Well, I'll, I'll be honest, even these on my list, I don't know a great deal about. But, you know, to me, sometimes the goody two-shoes gods are arguably less interesting. Yes, yes, I agree. I mean, I'm probably more likely to choose one of those gods if I've been playing a good cleric, but that being said, you know, I think some of the more interesting ones might be the ones associated with the trickery domain, for starters. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A few of those, uh, for instance, would be uh, Lyra, goddess of illusion, and there's Mask, I believe is the god of Thebes. Yeah. And Bathsheba, I believe, is Misfortune, if I've got that right. Yep, and these are all Forgotten Realm deities. Yeah, I mostly made my list from Forgotten Realms, to be honest. So That's totally cool. There's so many. There's so many, I know. Yeah, no, But just like, I started looking up, I was like, oh, trickery gods sound interesting, and those are a few that came up. So specifically, the illusion god um, sounded very interesting. There's, you know, I mentioned Mistra earlier. I think Mistra is kind of interesting. She sounds a little generic at face value. She's just the goddess of magic, but maybe interesting because I think it's her sort of job to keep magic from getting out of hand, from being too, uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know, like any one person having too much magical control or something. Kind of the, the magic police, I guess. Yeah, she is responsible for the weave. She came into existence at the same time as the weave. Mm, yes. 
So there, she's got a lot of history there. I think that kind of makes her interesting. Whereas perhaps against a, a, a trickery god, maybe maybe she's a little more generic. But I, I should have mentioned this earlier. One of the ones that I am sort of familiar with, the Bahamut is sort of interesting to me. I think that counts as more of a racial specific god. You know, it's the good god of dragons, if that's a decent summary. Yeah, he is the patron god of metallic dragons, so good aligned dragons. And in some settings, Dragonborn would revere him. In other settings, Dragonborn hate gods. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I played a Dragonborn once, so that you know that's that's kind of why I'm sort of familiar with him. But uh, you know, it seems sort of interesting for that and the history there. The reason that some revere and some hate him is kind of, kind of interesting. Yeah, Dragonborn are interesting because originally it was a class that you achieved in 3.5. Oh, okay. And then in fourth edition, it became an actual race with a culture and a history. And then when they had to bring that race into 5th edition, they had to bring them into the Forgotten Realms because otherwise people would go all nutty about it. Mm -hmm. They came from a world where they were ruled over by tyrannical dragons. So why would they ever worship the god of dragons? Yep. That's very, yeah, that's very true. And I guess what just makes him interesting to me is, is because he is a dragon. Episode one of this, I think we talked about, that's one of the cool things about playing d d Yeah, he is a platinum dragon. Platinum dragons, like this, this like super powerful space dragon or something. Mm-hmm. So anyway, yeah, how about you? What, what do you find more interesting, less interesting? Believe it or not, I the same way. I like questionable gods. <laughs> gods yeah. like Mask. The Raven Queen, Melora, Ali Damara, gods that are less rigid in their ideology. Yeah. But probably one of my favorite gods is Eliastri. She is not a well known or largely powerful, like high end deity. She's very niche. She is a drow goddess. Oh. Okay. She is a daughter of Lolth, and she is the only good aligned goddess of the Drow Pantheon. That's right. And the only people in Drow culture who tend to know about her are like matron mothers, like the high clerics of their houses, because they don't want people to know about her. Mm. She's been asked to join Corlon's Pantheon, but she refuses. She does not leave the Drow because she protects those Drow who eschew Lolth and the culture that she nurtures and creates. Eliastri feels that if she leaves, who will guide those good-hearted drow away into the surface? Ah, yeah. She is a moon goddess. She is called the Moon Dancer. She is a goddess of swords and music and dance and freedom. Sounds very mysterious, too. Yeah, she's not very well known, but she's really kind of interesting. I find lawful good gods like Pelor and Lathander very constraining and very rigid. Mm -hmm. They have their place, obviously, but each god is interesting if you read enough about them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The god I probably find least interesting would be St. Cuthbert. He sounds kind of boring, to be honest. Yeah, St. Cuthbert is the god of common sense, essentially. (laughs) But he remains a mainstay in Greyhawk. He is one of the prime, most powerful upper echelon deities. He's got a few other things, but I feel he's most widely known for being the god of common sense. Yeah. Some of the, you said this too, right? Some of the, like, lawful gods may be a little less interesting because they are pretty restrictive. Although I, I suppose you could make an argument that some of them could be interesting because of the fact that they prescribed us such a strict law. Like, you know, like a lawful evil god. Yeah, Asmodeus is very interesting. Yeah. Lawful good gods, kind of boring to me. Yeah, kind of boring. Lawful evil, though. Asmodeus, that dude, man, he's so interesting. His backstory, his history is extremely interesting, and I think everybody should read it, because he has been on trial by other deities before, and he won the trial. (laughs) Because Primus was like, well, he hasn't broken any laws. Yeah. Everybody who enters into a contract with him knows exactly what's going on. Yeah. You know, I'm sorry you angels are angry about it, but tough (laughs) snooky. Yeah, sorry you got a bad deal. Yeah, yeah some, of the, some of the other evil gods can be a little interesting. Malar, for instance, I, I just found him because he came up under a suggested nature domain god, but he, and he's the god of the hunt, I should specify. Yeah. But he's a kind of an evil god. Yeah, because he's not hunting for survival. He's hunting for sport. He's hunting for sport, yeah. He might be an interesting choice if you wanted to play like an evil druid, perhaps. Or a nature cleric, I guess. Mm-hmm. The list goes on and on. Yeah. And that is not to say that only clerics and druids need to emulate gods. Correct. Yeah. A bard could, for instance. A bard can. A fighter can. Yeah. You know, it's all just, would your character follow one of these gods? If so, which one would they ascribe to? And how do those beliefs and ideals impact their worldview? I think, uh, what is it, Agma, god of knowledge, uh, might be mm-hmm. a good choice for a bard, for instance. They're about spreading stories and information. I might put him on my list of less interesting. <laughs> right. but... but, you know, Sune, 
goddess of love and beauty. She's all about like physical perfection. Oh yeah, that's the another <laughs> a bard quality there. Like. Yeah, a tiefling bard I could totally see going full on Sune. That's pretty funny. What gods would make your short list? For me, it's Eliastri and the Raven Queen. I find them fascinating. Mm-hmm. And do you have any thoughts on like home brewed gods? Well, I'm going to say I also agree with you about the Raven Queen. She is fascinating. And, you know, a couple of the ones I listed before, the trickery gods, you know, I think I'd like to find an excuse to play a character that prescribes to their uh, <laughs> their way of thinking. But when we were making characters for Newly Forged, I almost went kind of the opposite route with Spood, my knowledge cleric. And I wanted to play a turtle. I wanted to play a cleric. But when we were choosing the domain, I almost went death cleric. Yeah. And we made a deity named Kreska. Kreska, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the D, I mean, the DD was really cool because it was very specific to the place that my character was from and specific mm-hmm. to the world which Jared has created for Newly. So it was just, you know, very unique and very cool. And I, it was a shame that I didn't use it. But perhaps, you know, there's an opportunity later. Well, just because you didn't use it doesn't mean that Kreska isn't out there in Newly and ha- and doesn't have followers. Like, I know, that's true. I'm waiting to I find him. I created like, him, so he's there somewhere. <laughs> he's there. I know, I'm, I'm excited now to find a, a turtle death cleric, you know, in, in my travels and be like, wait a minute. I mean, turtles may not be his primary devotees, but there may be a few. That's true. I won't ruin anything. We'll wait. You'll have to watch Newly Forge and see if he pops up sometime. Yeah, but that is not the only god that I've created for Newly, actually. The first campaign I ran in Newly a few years ago with my friends in my home game, uh, I homebrewed a god for one of my players because on the random trinket table, they rolled a holy symbol of a forgotten deity. Oh. And they were playing a monk who was abandoned at a monastery at an early age. Like, that was the backstory that he came up with. Oh, yeah. So, obviously, he was found with this trinket. Well, I rolled it up, and I was like, okay, this is what it looks like. This is what the god was. And I created a god named Decidia, the goddess of choice and free will. Oh, very cool. There are obviously opportunities to create your own gods in your world, and sky's the limit. Yeah. Sort of borrow from other examples, or Mm -hmm. make one off, merge a few, whatever. Yeah. All of these gods exist to serve the purpose that you need them to serve. If you need to throw them in a pot and mix them all up, do it. Like, maybe there aren't five different war gods in your world. Maybe there's one war god, and maybe you pick one. Or maybe it's an amalgamation of all the gods from the Forgotten Realms, and that's your war god. Yeah, and making one to suit a character's needs at creation, of course, could be really interesting, too. And and just, you know, well, you've created a god for this character, like Jared said. Well, he's in the world now, so how does that affect other things? Yeah. In conclusion, all this talk about gods in D&D, they're complex. There's no way around it. Do you need them? No. Clerics and paladins can get their divine magic from other ideas or other sources. That is proven in the Dark Sun setting where they get them from elemental powers. Paladins don't even need a deity. They just need an ideal. That can be a much larger concept. But D&D gods do provide a great guidepost for adventure, for culture, for challenges, not only in the possibility of a holy quest, but in character development for the PCs and the world around them. There is so much lore and history of these gods, and I highly recommend that folks go and read up on these gods. As a DM, you do not need to know everything about them. Use what you want. Use what works for you in your campaign. They should not make you feel constrained. They should be a tool that you use to heighten the game for all your players. As a player, the god or gods you may choose to worship can help you to figure out what you want from the world, how you interact with it, and if you prescribe to an ideology, it probably has rules that can help guide your character through some choices that you may have to make in roleplay or battle tactics even. I cannot add anything to that, really. (laughs) (laughs) So well said, honestly. Well, thank you all for joining us on this holy pilgrimage through the godly realms of D&D. Please come back next episode, where we will be talking about combat. Remember to check out our friend and the composer of all the music used on Mid-Level Adventurers, John D. Ivey, on SoundCloud.com. Join us on Facebook at Mid-Level Adventurers. Please follow us on Twitter and Instagram at MidLVL Adventure. And please check out our website on Wix at MidLevelAdventurer.Wixsite.com. And feel free to email us at MidLevelAdventurers at gmail.com. And watch Jared and I on Newly Forged, Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash newlyforged. That's N-U-U-L-I-F-O-R-G-E-D. And as always, I'm Jared Jehoda. And I'm Matt Morris. Until then, mind the traps and keep adventuring. Keep adventuring.